This recording is intended to review some of the key points of what's in your notes as well as what was covered in lab. It is not meant to replace you looking at your notes because I'm not going to cover everything. So I highly recommend you review your terminology. But what I'm going to do is I will give you some examples of how it applies, where you're going to see some of these terms again. But what I want to do first is review anatomical position. Now, anatomical position is used as a means, as a, as a frame of reference. The um, use of anatomical terminology itself is meant to kind of make communication a lot easier. You can use much fewer words to explain certain regions or in, in regards to direction, things like that. Now, you always will assume no matter what the position the body is in, that the person that we're referring to anatomical position. Now, what you'll notice, key points, anatomical position, subject is upright, palms facing forward, feet about what hip distance apart, facing forward, person is looking ahead. Anytime you refer to right or left, it's always the subject's right, not your right. I am looking at this individual, if I say um, the person had an injury to the right um, anterior femoral region, I would be referring to right here because it's the subjects, right? And I had said anterior, so it's in the front. So it's this is would be posterior. So it would be right is the subjects, right? Now, other couple other terms uh, or positions I don't refer to is prone and supine. Prone is where you're lying down, face down. This one is prone. Supine is where you're facing up. So the way to remember it is to do push-ups, you need to be in the prone position. To do sit-ups, you need to be in the supine position. I want to do is kind of show you again the directional terms that you should be aware of. So these are in regards to, um, say, for example, if I said um, the ear is lateral to the nose because it's to the side. So you see the lateral. The um, Notice that each of the directional terms is always an opposite. So proximal versus distal, lateral versus medial, and there, you know, on and so forth. So you can look at your notes for the definitions of these. But what I'm going to do is, as I'm going along, I'll give you some examples of how these terms apply. So first, I'm going to show you these are the two bones of the leg and the tibia and the fibula. And in terminology, we talk about um, landmarks or bone markings on the bones. You notice like right here, I have lateral and medial condyle. Now this is the right tibia. So the person, like this, it's the lower leg. So it's right here. This is the medial condyle because it's towards the midline. Lateral is away from the midline. So the medial and lateral condyles actually form joints with the medial and lateral condyles of the femur, which is the bone of your thigh. Also, you'll notice down here on the tibia, we have this bone marking called the medial malleolus because it's found in the medial surface. If you feel down at your ankle, on the inside of your ankle, that little bony pro um, projection that you feel is the medial malleolus. Other term, or like during directional terms, is actually, I'll come back here, is if I'm talking about proximal versus distal end of, of the bones. These are the proximal ends, these are the distal ends of the bone. Proximal, because it's closer to the trunk or closer to a point of attachment. So in the case here, when you form a joint with the femur, this is closer to the point of attachment. Here it's further away. I can apply it to the bones of your forearm, your radius and your ulna. This is the anterior view of how the bones look. This is a posterior view. This would be the right, what you'd see in the right arm. I also wanted to show you that you see this term here, olecranon, or it's also referred to as the olecranon process of the ulna. 
That's your elbow. When you feel your elbow, that's the posterior aspect of your elbow. So you've seen that term before. In this example, what we're seeing is a section through your spinal cord. And what you'll notice is you see term dorsal and ventral. So this is the where your back would be. This is the front. So you'll see we have a dorsal root which carries axons of sensory neurons and it goes to the back part of the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. So it runs through called the dorsal root. The ventral root is carrying has axons of motor neurons that are carrying information out from the anterior aspect of the spinal cord we call ventral root. Um, you also notice that here in this gray matter of the spinal cord you see dorsal and ventral and lateral and you can use terms interchangeably like dorsal versus posterior ventral and anterior and then you see lateral horn because the lateral horn is on the side so you're going to see a lot of this terminology as you proceed along in anatomy and physiology now another um, thing I want to look at is you've heard of calcaneus or calcaneus depending on how you want to pronounce it remember that is your heel and it actually is one of the bones of the ankle referred to as the calcaneus so that's your heel here are the metatarsals these are the bones that make up the arch of your foot the phalanges can include refer to the phalanges in the in the hand but also the feet so you'll notice this there in the toe there's two phalanges and what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover co color this is the distal phalanx uh, um, in green and the proximal phalanx in yellow so you kind of see the terminology in regards to, to, to proximal and distal again when you look at these these bones referred to as the cuneiforms there's actually three cuneiforms that are part of the tarsal bones the bones of your ankle this one right here is the medial cuneiform the one next to it is the intermediate cuneiform and the one over here is referred as the lateral cuneiform so you kind of again see that terminology over and over again now remember with the four-legged animals quadrupeds some of the terminology what we talk about with humans anterior you can also use the term ventral but you can't do that in quadrupeds because they're on all fours so here the back is dorsal but it is superior the belly is ventral but it's also inferior the back end is posterior or caudal while up here the head region cephalic and anterior so this is what you see with quadrupeds in humans dorsal is posterior ventral is anterior caudal is inferior and cephalic is superior okay so i want to begin just use or use is show you again some terminology that you heard of and show how it applies applies to real life. Hallux was a term for your big toe. Someone with hallux rigidus means that the the joint that you see here with the big toe is rigid and you're not going to be able to move your toe up. So you have it's a condition where you it limits your motion of that big toe. So you see the term hallux. Here you'll see these these are derived from pollux, which means your thumb. These are muscles of the thumb. You see over here, digiti. That's from digital or digits, which means fingers or toes. Well, these are muscles of the fingers that allows, you know, allows the, the fingers to move in certain directions. Here this region right here these are the vertebra the lumbar vertebra remember lumbar means lower back 
So those, the vertebra found in the lower back. These ones are thoracic vertebra. And up here, you have cervical vertebra. They protect the spinal cord in that's running down through your neck, okay? Also another term, and a lot of people do, they, they write this out when they should write anti-cubital fossa. Remember, anti-cubital is your anterior elbow. So it's the, in, you know, it's the in, or inside of your elbow. So here, this region is where we're going to find a lot of nerves, muscles, bones, blood vessels, and the an anti-cubital fossa, the uh, phlebotomists need to know where certain blood vessels run so they can do blood draws. Typically, they use this median cubital vein to do a venipuncture. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that. Also, you've heard the term inguinal. So if you have an inguinal hernia, that means you have a hernia, hernia within the groin region. This one is an umbilical hernia. So getting down the anatomical terminology now is going to make it so much easier later when you're starting to have to do things with the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, all, bones. When you have to start naming things, if you have those down, it makes it much easier. Now, next thing I want to look at is planes or sectional planes. Planes could be imaginary or they could be where you're actually cutting through something and making it through a certain way and creating certain sections. So here what I did is I took an apple and so we'll just pretend that the apple is alive. Here's the eye. Here, put blue this, okay? What I did is I cut the apple in certain planes to create certain sections. So if I cut the apple kind of like here, down from the top like this, you create this, which is a frontal, or you could refer to coronal plane if it's cutting through the head. Corona means crown, so that's how you can remember it. These type of sections, you're creating anterior and posterior sections. And depending on how you cut it, you're gonna see different views, and that applies to any of these sections. If I cut real, like if I looked at the, the front side of this, it's gonna, I'm gonna see this. But as I go further back, I'm not necessarily going to see the eyes and the mouth. This one, I'm going to erase this here. For the next one, what I did is I was cutting like this. And so what I created was a sagittal section. So you're separating things right from the lefts. And the last one, if I cut this way is a transverse section. So you're separating things from superior, inferior, top and bottom. So this is like I say if I took something and like if I took a, a like a heart and I created different sections and cut it, you would get different views. Now in some instances we don't have to physically cut something is a lot of the imaging techniques will create various views by creating imaginary sections through your body. So here is example some MRIs. So MRIs, what you see in is the three different sections again. So transverse, sagittal, and coronal, and you're seeing different views of, in this case, the brain. Now, other thing I want to look talk about it is your body cavity. So you have all this written for your notes, just we'll go through this relatively quick, quickly, is you have organs located in certain body cavities, kind of like spaces. Your dorsal body cavities are the ones in the back, you have two of them. The cranial cavity, which houses the brain. The spinal cavity houses your spinal cord. Then you have your ventral body cavities, the ones that are found on the anterior aspect of your body. You have your thoracic cavity, which includes the pleural, which pleural cavity, which is where we find the lungs. Pericardial cavity has the heart. Then separating the thoracic cavity 
from the abdominal pelvic cavity is your diaphragm. That's going to be your reference point. So below the diaphragm, we have the abdominal pelvic cavity, which includes the abdominal and the pelvic cavity. Please keep in mind that if I ask you what cavity a particular organ is located in, you be as specific as you can. So any of the ones I just circled in green, those would be your answers. I wouldn't want thoracic. It's not specific enough. I wouldn't want this one. It's not specific enough. I wouldn't want ventral or dorsal body cavities because, again, they're not specific enough. Now, what you'll notice on this picture is they kind of brought out the heart and the pericardial cavity to kind of illustrate one of the serous membranes. Now, serous membranes are found within only ventral body cavities. They're not found in dorsal body cavities. With the serous membranes, they have two components to it. It's pretty much a continuous sheet of membrane that's just been kind of folded back over. And what you'll find is the layer that's in physical contact with the organ is called the visceral layer. And viscera means organ. So if I eviscerate somebody, I'm going to be removing some organs from them. And usually if I say eviscerate, I'm going to move a lot of them. So just kind of look that term up. The layer that kind of cover that lines the wall of the cavity is referred to as the parietal layer. So in this case, it's the parietal pericardium because it's associated with the heart. The space in between is the cavity. So in this case, it's the pericardial cavity. There really isn't a lot of air, or, you know, like open space in those cavities. Really, these two layers are kind of in contact with each other. And in between, you have a thin layer of fluid, and they call it serous fluid. What the purpose of that, and of, of serous membranes, is to lubricate and to prevent adhesions that would happen if we didn't have that fluid. We want to try to keep the organs be able to freely move and not create, start to adhere to each other. Now the pericardium is the serous membrane associated with the heart. When we look at the lungs, the lungs have, you know, they're found in that pleural cavity, but we have a visceral pleura, which is in physical contact with the lungs, and the parietal pleura kind of cut, it lines the wall of the cavity. Okay, so, so we have, again, two components. The pleural cavity Again, it's, there's not a lot of space there. It's just the two pleura are in connection with each other, separated by a little bit of fluid. And the last one, when we look in the abdominal cavity, we have what's referred to as the, oh, sorry, just let's go through this. I should have used those. We have what we call the peritoneum. Actually, I wanted to use this one. We have a visceral and we have a parietal peritoneum. So this cadaver, what they did is they cut it open and what you see right here, the shiny part, is the parietal peritoneum. The space between that and what you see here, pretty much tightly attached to the intestine, is the visceral peritoneum. In between was the peritoneal cavity. Okay, So you see this, um, the peritoneum associated with the organs in the abdominal region. There will be some examples of some organs that are referred to as being retroperitoneal. They are located behind the parietal peritoneum, so they don't have a visceral layer. So the kidneys and the adrenals are examples of organs that are actually considered retroperitoneal. This uh, completes a little bit of a review of the terms in regards to some of the anatomical terminology, the cavities, the planes, the serous membranes. I will do a, another one just to kind of really quickly go over the regional terms and I'm also going to do another one that kind of goes and reviews in regards to um, not anatomical terminology but um, positive versus negative feedback.